Hello and welcome to The No Club. My name is Anna. First, I want to say rest in power, Tyree Nichols. It's all the time. And reading When Police Kill, we are on part two. Uh, We ended on page 12, so we're going to pick up there. Now, this is a very extensive, comprehensive analysis of police murder, brutality, killing in America specifically. I do not know how much of this book talks about race. I would assume there would be some, but that is... It yes, it is a problem, but there's something. It's not. I've been I've been seeing in the media even with this. Um, of people commenting saying because it was five police officers who were who have been arrested have been. Uh, it, it's ongoing right now as we speak. Um, but it wasn't just five black officers who murdered Tyree. There were a total of seven officers there, two of which were white, but the media just cherry-picked who they wanted to talk about. No fucking surprise there. And just in the past few hours, because the video footage has been released to the public, so there's no way of, like, we see what you're fucking doing. Memphis PD, Memphis media, like, it's... You were going to get called out on it. You're getting called out on it that you are treating this as black on black crime and not violent police murder. And the problem of this type of killing, justifiable killing, for all lackeys of the state in this country. So it's very clear that this is um, this was their agenda and it does seem that they won't be get won't be able to get away with it entirely. So that one officer who tased Tyree um, and said, I hope they stomp on him. Sorry, my apologies. I should have started immediately with trigger warnings. They're all in my captions. Assume that every single video is going to be triggering because we talk about things where we need to we need to know what the fuck is going on um, because you cannot trust the media whatsoever so we rely on individuals who have already done all of the work so we can educate ourselves and I am glad we are doing that together because this is a part of the revolution and radicalizing oneself is being in the know understanding what is going on around you um, and all of the nuances of living in America and it's all connected Nothing is just one thing. Nothing is black or white. Everything's connected. Um, And I mean, when I say that, is that it's not just about racism. It's not just about misogyny. It is everything connected. It is all capitalism, white supremacy, misogyny, racism. All of it is commingled into one giant disease here. So that one officer, I can't remember his first name, but it's like his middle, middle and like hemp hill. And he kind of looks like the fucking character. Like, uh, oh God, what is his name? It's like a cartoon character. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it, that's irrelevant. Um, but he has been, is on administrative leave as of right now. Uh, no arrest has been made though, but they were quick, quick. And, and rightfully so to, um, I believe these five black officers have been arrested now, but it took them 20 days. How long did it take after George Floyd when all the officers were white? A little more than 20 fucking days. How long was it? Fucking years? It was, ins- it was insane. And a press release by the White House came out today um, and they're they're saying this is the worst video documentation of police brutality we've ever seen. Bullshit. Fucking bullshit. That's cap. 100%. You're just saying that because it's a part of the agenda. 
because you wanted to frame it as no white people were involved. Therefore, it's deplorable. And it is a deplorable act, obviously. It's fucking heinous and they should be arrested. And, but that's not what this is about. It's about the disease of police brutality in America and where that just under let's let's fucking understand it. Let's just jump right in. Um, clearly, this is going to continue to be a problem here. And things all of our systems in America are currently crumbling. And every institution that we once believed we could rely upon we no longer can, not our education system, not certainly not our healthcare system, the military industrial complex, none of that shit, our government, um, media, everything we have to question. And that is a very difficult existence to be in. So seeking out knowledge when you cannot trust anything around you that's presented to you as is like, this is a factual thing. You have to dig a little bit deeper. You have to use critical thinking. And that takes up brain power and that takes up energy and space. And not everybody, most people don't have access to that because that's the whole thing of capitalism is to keep you working so much so that you can't think for yourself because you don't have the fucking time or the mental capacity to do so. So any little battles that you can do for yourself to fight the system is worthwhile and everybody's gonna you know have opinions and ideas of how you move forward in this but there's no right way this is one way to do it is to know what is going on and understanding the systems of control and understanding um how you've been lied to and radicalizing yourself with knowledge um especially like my god it's just like fucking insane it's fucking insane here it's absolutely crazy it's like over this is another thing entirely. And I said, oh, we're going to jump right in. But it's just like the information just piles on and piles on day in and day out. And it's one thing. I feel like a lot of people now are be getting almost past a point of desensitized to it. Because when you've had like enough of a traumatic event happening over and over and over again, um, you think that you would get to a place where, oh, you're desensitized to it, you don't care anymore. But if you actually sit down with it and you realize, no, this is so fucked up, this keeps happening and keeps happening and I'm just fed up and I'm not desensitized to it and you have to confront it, um, white people need to get there. Uh, we cannot be desensitized to this at all. Um, I did not watch the video. I will not be watching the video. Uh, I know what it is. And then you hear the, the cops right there. Did you hear that? Like, whoop, whoop. It sounded like a fucking beep. Just a whoop, whoop. My girlfriend's a DJ sometimes. It just, that's where I can go and I can free myself uh, and just dance. Like that's how I can get away from it. Everybody needs that outlet. Everybody fucking needs that outlet. Oh my God. All of our systems are crumbling and what are we going to do about it? Because we are, if you work to survive, work to live, which is the majority of this country, um, then, uh, oh God, I have like 80 million things I want to say. It's like too much. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, you're being exploited essentially. Um, and to cling on to this idea that one day you're going to be a millionaire um, is going to keep you in this fucking rat race and it's only going to get worse. Inflation? Yeah. Uh, seems to me that that's not fucking real at all. And that word is just using knowledge, using the power of language, which is your best weapon moving forward, is your words, your ability to retain information and communicate that information, which is a skill that can be practiced. And it is not just for, uh, it's not elite. It can be come across as elitist because that this country has done that because all of our systems of education are linked to having a fuck ton of money. Um, so, it's important to use your words and the word inflation 
is just like a mask for greed. It's just corporate fucking greed. Something has to give in this country because everything is breaking down and we are continually lifting the veil and we're being shown god bless social media i mean as fucked up as it is without it we would not be able to move forward now the scary thing is because of social media all the people who are radicalized on the opposing side all of the nazi enthusiasts and crazy 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 evil motherfuckers are being indoctrinated even further and they're having kids because they're really into procreation and subjugation of women. Oh my God, I watched a whole show about the FLDS church recently, the fundamentalist church of like Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, but the fundamentalist ones, crazy motherfuckers. Absolutely insane. It was riveting television and it was very unfortunate that I had that thought. Um, But I was not desensitized to it. It made me sick to my fucking stomach to see these people suffering and the abuse of the children and the just, it was horrible, horrible. And that was just on TV and it was just like casual thing and how they still have like 10,000 members today. Wow, a little off topic, but, but is it? No, because everything is connected. And right now I'm just going on a train of thought. Um, Feels a little more podcasty right now. Uh, apologies. We will get into this reading. I just have to like speak, you know, I haven't talked to anybody too much about, you know, the information that I'm consuming, um, the necessary information to understand what is happening around me and to really feel the scope of it. And the one thing that I keep hearing and reading about and understanding is that you cannot become hopeless. That is the worst possible thing to happen. And the past few years, not even recently, I'm like past that point. That's what I mean. I'm like not desensitized anymore. Because once you're there, you are, you're a little, you're a little hopeless. If you can feel those sensations in a healthy way for yourself, that you can cope with it, you find a way to, to tackle the information and to take it in, you can find hope again. You have to. You fucking have to. And once you accept that, yeah, the systems are fucked up and you've been lied to. And once you've worked through that pain, um, the quicker you can get to a place where you can tackle that information. And that's hopefully where we are at right now because that's where I'm at. So I hope you can meet me there. Um, And even if you can't and some of this information is just way too fucking much for you and you got to like back away or you got to listen to another book or some, something else. I totally get that. You can come back when you're ready or you can read it on your own. I like to do this because if you haven't seen my other videos, I have stated that speaking and using my voice is a part of my autonomy and feeling that my voice has value is one of my many purposes here on this planet is I need to experience my own voice literally hearing my own voice and using it not just to not just to speak but to say something that has meaning and has impact Um, and it's also the best way that I learn and that's just me so this is how I like to go about um, processing information essentially so like fucking get into it if you're if you're there with me like let's fucking do it together because it's tough we can do it though we can do hard things (laughs) we can do tough things we're strong people oh my god it's so fucking crazy here's a here's a fact and then and then i'm gonna get into it even though i have so many other things i want to say here's a fact the sixth leading cause of death for men in America for white men is heart disease. The sixth, the sixth for black men. I think we all can, you can kind of, you can, it's police. I feel like that was kind of obvious since this is the topic at hand and will continue to be the topic until it's fucking fixed. And it's crazy. The, the, the pages that we were reading, those first 12 pages were so 
eye-opening and enlightening at how the media just chose to not talk about police violence in this country at fucking all um and how they make it like a uh an individual state issue and now a little bit you know black on black crime issue which is not the bigger issue of the the government and in the entire police system and what's fucking crazy about Tyree is that they were using tactics that are used in everyday regular traffic stops and also it came out today that there were no indication that he was had any sort of erratic driving when when he was pulled over for this driving stop so just no fucking reason for the whole thing other than to take a black life that should absolutely enrage you and truly truly nothing in this country which is founded on violence those are our core values what do you think is going to how is the system going to change without it we are going to have to get violent there's like no other way around it I really don't see and everybody that I talk to is like yeah I really don't see anything that's going to change in this country unless things start to get violent. And that's really fucking, um, yeah, it's really fucking scary. We live in a scary world. We live in a fucking scary world. So have your joys, you know, treat yourself, (laughs) do the things that are good for you. Um, but fucking start getting radicalized. And I don't have any advice moving forward other than use your voice and knowledge is key. All that being said, let's jump in. Page 12. Okay, and I know I'm going to be stopping here and there just because I'm going to get really pissed off. Um, Because the whole entire experience of living in, in the United States is enraging, is infuriating. So... This is just, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I'm going to try like not to get, I'm going to try to quell my emotions. Okay. We are at, um, we've been talking about the 2014 shooting of Michael Brown and how this, um, the Ferguson shooting changed things, shifted things in the media and how it finally brought to the media to the entire country's attention of the pandemic the epidemic of uh police brutality in the states because it's always been there but being publicized being talked about until then was not really a thing and so there were statistics we were reading about last time of the executions in the united states versus police shootings murders And they related, uh, Franklin related those two things together because they are both um, viable killings, you know, excusable killings by the state, by the government. Um, And talking a little bit about how when we think of the police, we think of it as a state issue and not a government issue, not a national issue, just a state by state or community by community issue. So when something happens in Baltimore, the things that are happening in California and Oakland, they aren't, we aren't hearing about Oakland and Oakland isn't hearing about Baltimore. Um, Also, these things happen at such a high rate that um, it's fucking shocking. It is fucking shocking. Um, The, the lying by omission in the media is horrifying. Now, are they doing it to keep the order? To not have people become violent? I think that's part of it. Uh, And the fact that it's even happening is to keep the order. And also, it's a way of Keeping us separated, keeping us from coming together, from seeing the bigger picture, but that is breaking down. That I I feel it, 
everyone I talk to, every video I see, I mean, maybe it's my circles um, and the things that I consume online, but I just see people becoming more and more aware and coming together and seeing the bigger issue. So he was relating executions and police shootings and the media and saying, uh, you know, it was around on average, I can't remember the time frame, I believe it was like 2002 to 2012, but it could have been 2008 to 2012. Um, I can look back here. Yeah, here we go. It was an average annual reported deaths from executions and police killings. Here it was, 2008 to 2012. The executions per year, um, 44. And then police killings were 404. And those police killings are uh, reported to the SHR program. And the ratio is all fucking off because of under reporting so that number is also inaccurate that 404 it is much higher we don't know the number because of under reporting now in the media they aren't they aren't talking about it at fucking all but they'll talk about the death penalty because that's seen as a nationwide problem not a state by state that is big government that's an issue doesn't matter what state it happens in in the public eye that's how it's viewed so the media treats it that way now the media has the power because that is communication now with more and more people talking and using their own voices and getting on tiktok and sharing videos and sharing information with each other the media is becoming becoming less and less of a power source, but it is still a main power source. We are becoming our own media, which I think is for the revolution, for changing, imperative. It's also scary because there's 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 going to be the evil people, and there are, who are going to use it to galvanize their fucking crazy murderous, I just, coups and violent attacks but everything's in a gray area nothing's black and white you have to take the bad with the good unfortunately moving forward so let's continue on understanding what the fuck is going on with policing in the United States the consequences of non aggregation non aggregation the now infamous 2014 shooting of Michael Brown provides a good example of the individual drama focus and its effects. Michael Brown and Officer Darren Wilson both became national celebrities in the aftermath of the events of August 2014 and other cases of police violence such as the death of Eric Gardner in New York City uh huh, and Freddie Gray in Baltimore were linked to the Brown case in media discussion. But there was very little or no discussion in what the Associated Press called, quote, the top news stories of 2014, end quote, of the total number of killings by police in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 or in the state of Missouri or in the United States as a whole. The killings weren't added up. And this is what they fucking do and determined to be examples of a larger national problem. They're not, the main media sources are not putting it out there for us because they want us to not turn to violence. They want us to not make those connections. We're not fucking stupid. And the preferences and policies that have had a continuing influence in a large number of cases did not become an important part of the conversation. And so we're here again. The lessons of Rodney King. Whatever the obscurity of police violence as a major issue prior to 2014, the attention paid by media and the government in 2014 and 2015 may have changed the public importance of police violence in the future discussion and analysis. Now, you see how that said may have changed the public importance? May. It's still fucking happening. And, and, and we are outraged. We are pissed. But where's the change? We can, you know, 
peacefully protest in the streets, but that gets us, get, gets us nowhere. So what is the next course of action? Okay, I think we know the answer to that. What developments might signal real change? Or is it possible that the subject of police shootings might instead regress to its previous obscurity as a national concern? That is scary and that is the truth of the current moment. Um, Because I feel people just being like, it's all too much. I can't. I can't handle it. The story of Rodney King, a young African-American man savagely beaten by Los Angeles police in 1991 in an episode captured on an onlookers video camera, provides a relevant parallel in recent American history to Ferguson and Michael Brown. Rodney King was a victim of obvious and extreme excessive force, but he survived his attack during a year when hundreds of Americans died by police force. Why was there so much focus on Rodney King? One claim to attention was a video of much of the beating, and a large part of what commanded national attention as the Rodney King case developed was the character of the response to the beating, which include the eventual acquittal of three Los Angeles police officers of state criminal charges. Any history of the era era must acknowledge that the acquittal and subsequent riots were as significant as the photographic evidence of the unprovoked beating. What cemented the importance of the event was its impact on the minority communities in Los Angeles, such as the Ferguson shooting became a national event a decade and a half later because of the reactions and demonstrations that followed in its wake. So it is important to demonstrate and to riot and to cry out But has it worked? But how long does a case like that of Rodney King or of Michael Brown stay at center stage in public consciousness? And with what effect the riots after the acquittal in the Rodney King case further extended the period of notoriety that had already reached well beyond the initial beatings? By 1994, however, Public attitudes toward crime and crime policy had turned hostile, and there was little introspective concern with excessive police force in the national discussion of crime policy. Rodney King was off the front page. I am so impressed by this book already. It's hitting all of the notes. It's not saying this is exactly how, you know, it's just the nuance. The nuance is welcomed and it's a complicated issue and we have to fucking talk about it. Yet the episode had inspired an effort by some serious congressional Democrats to produce legislation that would give the Federal Department of Justice the power to initiate civil suits or to threaten them against police departments that were habitually ineffective at controlling excessive force. While a standalone version of this proposal did not pass in the early 1990s, the reintroduction of the same scheme as part of the Comprehensive Crime Control Act in 1994 quietly became federal law. Interesting. The role of the Rodney King incident as inspiration for the small but important federal program to review and reform the performance of problematic local police departments was by far the most important legacy of the event. And this illustrates that the potential influence of such events on the priorities and planning of experts can often persist even after the public concerns have started to abate. Okay. But Tyree... They didn't you they used excessive force, but they did everything that they were allowed to do. The police have been one hundred percent militarized here. We're in a fucking war zone in this country. We're not on paper, but we are in action. Over twenty thousand lives have been lost just in 
if you're looking at Ukraine, who's currently at war, over 6,000 lives since the war has begun have been taken. And around 20,000 shootings, gun violence. And that's not, that is not um, lives, that is not by suicide. 20,000 since Ukraine has started their war in this country have occurred. Now, I wonder how, you know, accurate both of those numbers are. But you can't deny that a country who is not actively at war, having that much, that many, the, the, the number, the weight, that many deaths by gun violence is staggering and should be terrifying. Not so much that it uh, causes you to have no action at all, but police, man, they are, they are out of, they're out of control. The Republicans are out of control. These gun lobbyists are out of fucking control here. Like it is out of fucking hand. It is out of hand. We have to put a stop to, to these motherfucking guns. Like for real. Like we can't, we can't, we can't go 10 more years like this. I mean, sure as shit, we fucking can, but a lot more people are going to die. Is that what we want? No, it's not what we fucking want. But an important difference between the impact of Rodney King on public perception of police violence and the cascading importance of Ferguson and its progeny on attitudes about police violence in the United States merits close attention. The Rodney King case remained for two decades a singular event rather than a representative example for most Americans of a recurrent and general problem. And that is a problem. The perception of police use of fatal force that grew in the wake of the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, on the other hand, quickly grew to include a whole list of victims and places in a wide variety of different scenarios of police force. Michael Brown was soon sharing the killings headlines with Freddie Gray in Baltimore, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Walter Scott in North Charleston, South Carolina, and the early death of Eric Gardner on Staten Island and George Floyd. The notorious episodes including included shootings, chokeholds, brutal restraints, and the delay in transport of an arrestee. As the range of events and the number of police departments implicated swiftly grew, the subject of public and media concern generalized. This was no longer just about Officer Darren Wilson and teenager Michael Brown. With so many police departments and officers involved, the subject of public and media concern became more institutional in focus, shifting from consideration of the behavior of individual police officers to identification of institutional patterns of lethal force. This was no longer as much about Ferguson or Cleveland or New York as about policing in the United States, which is a good thing, but at the same time, like this was written in 2017, and we're here. The transformation of the story from individual to institutional, from a series of singular events to reoccurring episodes of the use of lethal force that seemed to be worrisome because they were representative, is what sets the post-Ferguson era of concern apart from the earlier history of non-concern about police violence. What accounts for this major shift? I don't know. I do know my back fucking hurts sitting like this. I've got to fix my situation, like right here with this setup. I'm sorry to just shift tracks like that. Sometimes my mind does it, and I just need to a break to comment on the way that I'm my body is feeling in the moment. Um, but, yeah. That job that I had last week for like a day. Yeah. And I told you that that fell through. I'm still like fucking job hunting. It's been two months now. I've been out of work. And while it's a good thing that I'm not a wage slave to the system, unfortunately, I'm still in the system and I need to survive and I need to fucking figure out something soon because I'm starting to get a little worried about it. Um, any who's as with any event, the transformation of concern from individual focus to institutional patterns has multiple determining factors. Many more Americans had cell phone cameras in 2014 than had video cameras in 1991. 
True, true, true. So the raw material for public viewing has much greater, was much greater. And the same phones that create records can also display the visual evidence of problematic events. See, this is why media and the public having a voice and having access to see what the fuck is going on is important. Knowledge is power. And having videos on our cameras is uh, one way that we can we can hold people accountable in s some instances. In addition, the capacity of the protesters around Ferguson to generalize from the case to the broader problem was an important stimulus. It was thus not such a leap from remember Michael Brown to Black Lives Matter. One reason that the more general theme was easy to find was the very represented representativeness of the Michael Brown shooting. The shooting of Oscar Grant on the morning of New Year's Day 2009 in Oakland, California was an extreme example of unjustified lethal force as one could imagine. But that horrendous killing was far was too far removed from the hundreds of other police killings in the United States to serve as the foundation for a broad rethinking of police use of deadly force. I don't really understand that. I don't understand how one life gets more media attention than the other you know I do when like obviously one has been like recorded but if both have been if both are recorded and both are seen like I don't I, I, one life is not more important than the other maybe that was not um recorded you know oh god that coffee I just took a sip of was fucking shit that was fucking foul and I'm no longer drinking it. I'm putting a stand. I'm, I'm, I'm standing up to myself. I'm not treating my body like that anymore. Ew. Tasted like poo-poo. Again, I had to deviate for a second. Just bear with me. What may have launched Michael Brown's death as a, sing as a signal event in the history of American concern about lethal force by pol police was what came to be seen as its typicality. Interesting. Okay, so because it is a typical thing, that is why it is a cause for public concern, which is also how I'm feeling about Tyree, because there was... Nothing irregular in even his traffic stop. The double transformation of police killings. The United States in 2014 and 2015 saw not one transformation in the public career of police use of lethal violence. That's a scary sentence. The public career of police use of lethal violence because it is a whole fucking career. That is... God, this is this is the bad place. But two transformations that have permanently changed both the levels of government deeply involved in responding to killings of civilians by police and also the way in which the problem is defined and understood in public discourse. First, first, no longer was the tendency to regard each killing as a singular event unrelated to the other episodes that take place in other communities. The dominating discourse that is good. Eric Gardner was no longer just a problem for Staten Island and New York City. He was instead a part of a national problem. Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old killed in Cleveland, is also a factor when the police use of lethal force is considered as a national question. For that reason, the never-before-important issue of how many killings take place, wow, the never-before, never-before-important issue of how many many killings take place in the United States was suddenly in the news with the Washington Post and the Guardian in London undertaking to record respectively the number and circumstances of all fatal shootings by police and the number and circumstances of all killings by police in the United States for 2015. The number that was never news before was now a headline for the first time in the history of the topic. The use of lethal force by police was seen as a national concern. The second transformation in the public career of police killings was closely linked to the new national focus. What used to be regarded as an issue of crime policy or the regulation of police conduct had now come to be regarded as a question of civil rights. 
In this very important sense, the new slogans of the protest movement, the conceptual context of Black Lives Matter, is a self-conscious and successful attempt to view the taking of life as the central act and the victim's loss as the focus of concern. The salience of the civil rights emphasis to victims of police use of lethal force is not inappropriate given the most of that most of the prominent victims of 2014 and 2015 were African American. Thank you, Franklin. Now we're we're now we're getting somewhere. We're cooking. We've been getting there with the facts, you know. I'm not I'm not saying like listen. This kind of analysis takes time. You have to work through it. You got to get through the facts, but we're getting there. This has been followed by a serious effort to extend the range of civil rights concerns to the conduct of police in dealing with all individuals, including the mentally ill of all races. The transition from Black Lives Matter to Lives Matter should not be difficult or take long. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. The level of public concern and political energy devoted to the issue of police use of lethal force will vary. But from the perspective of 2017, the two key trans- uh, transformations from local to national and from crime control to civil rights seem irreversible. Thank fucking God for that. Um, I feel like that was almost like hitting all lives matter kind of vibe. You know what I mean? I didn't like that sentence so much. Um, there was not enough nuance with there. And then I was just like congratulating. Yes, we got there. Um, but then immediately after that, it kind of like backpedaled because obviously, obviously all lives matter. You don't have to say that, but that's not the fucking thing that's happening in this country. Oh, you know what I mean? Did you get that vibe too? Like I was like, mm, that was a little sus. Let's keep reading though. Um, actually, I have to see. I have to see one thing. Hold on. That makes sense. That that sentence now makes sense to me. Um, he's a white man. Yeah. All right. Just take that with a grain of salt. Take that with a grain of salt. Which is probably why he's not. He didn't attack. That's I'm I'm almost hundred percent certain. That's why he didn't um attack this from a standpoint on race. Okay. Hey, listen, we're still getting some amazing facts and understanding, but like that sentence felt a low key racist. That was a little call out. Like he's he just he just told on himself. Here we go. From concern to reform, sustained public concern about the control of police violence appears to be a necessary condition for creating a political and administrative environment that will produce better policy. But media attention and public concern alone are not sufficient conditions for effective police reform. True. The aforementioned inclusion of a Department of Justice office in the Federal Crime Bill of 1994 was in no sense inevitable three years after the Rodney King assault. Governmental agents and elite scholarly resources must follow up on public concern about lethal force, pu- police lethal force, as a social and governmental problem with empirical data and policy evaluation, adding a critical mass of expertise and a long, long range commitments to such endeavors. And maybe, just maybe, we get violent. I'm just saying, might be time, because everything is intertwined. We burn this shit to the fu- motherfucking ground. Reform is is not the answer to the police. It's not because nothing gets done in this country 
and public for public officials, you know, that's nothing. Nothing's happening. These politicians are not on our side. There's too much bureaucracy and too many bad apples, if you will. Um, who do you think are the types of people who go into the police force? Maybe ones that have a proclivity to violence, excited to enforce, um, men with issues, with violence. I'm just saying this is reform. I just, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it happening. I'm not seeing it working. Uh, because there was nothing that it was just, it was just brutal. Fucking Tyree's murder was just fucking brutal. And there was no, there was no reason for any of it. No reason for fucking any of it. Police can get, uh, into the police force. Like it after like six months, that's fucking insane. Granted, you don't need any credentials at fucking all to get a gun here. Less than that. Oh, the six month? Yikes. Scary, hello. Welcome. It's nice to have you here. I thought I was just, I've just been like talking to myself this, this entire time. Oh my fucking God. Three weeks? That's concerning. That is, um, that kind of, that makes me sick. Let's continue on, shall we? The, uh, I see, I completely lost my place because that just totally took me for a loop. Then after the ambulance, we were, yep, four months and got in. Yeah, I know. I know a couple people, not friends with them, but went to uh, high school with some lads who are now in the police force. Not good guys. Not good guys at all. Granted, he's a good police officer, right? Yeah. You can be a great person, but you still need adequate training. So let me backtrack. Let's go to, here we go, the knowledge gap. The historically low level of public concern about the rate and consequences of police killing in the United States is paralleled by an almost complete lack of recent empirical research on police killings and almost no sustained policy analysis about how different rules might influence the level of violence by police and its consequences for law enforcement and for urban life. In an attempt to organize what information is available on lethal violence by police, as well as to inventory the important empirical and policy questions about police use of force that require immediate scholarly and policy attention, I now turn to police use of deadly force as a separate and significant subject. Okay. I have to like your mic. Cut you out when you move too far from it. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have to get a new mic, I guess. <laughs> the special character of lethal force, the use of force, and therefore the possibility of violence is more than an occasional byproduct of police officers doing their jobs. It is an essential characteristic of the role of police in a modern social system. That is terrifying. Egon Bittner argued persuasively in his classic The Function of Police in Modern Society for what he called, quote, the capacity to use force as the core of the police role, end quote. Here is an excerpt from that. Many puzzling aspects of police work fall into place when one ceases to look at it as a principally concerned with law enforcement and crime control. It makes much more sense to say that the police are nothing else than a mechanism for the distribution of situationally justified force in society. This later conception is preferable on three grounds. First, it accords with the actual expectations and demands made of the police. Second, it gives a better accounting of the actual allocation of police manpower. And third, it lends unity to all kinds of police activity. And excerpt. This, the author argues, is what citizens and police both expect when citizens respond to a problem by, quote, calling the cops. 
He notes that whatever the substance of the problem that led to, continue on into, uh, into this excerpt, led to calling the cops, whether it involves protection against an undesired imposition, caring for those who cannot care for themselves, attempting to solve a crime, helping to save a life, abating a nuisance, or settling an explosive dispute, police intervention means, above all, making use of the capacity and authority to overpower resistance to an attempted solution in the native habit of the problem. I really enjoyed that analysis. Uh, and it, it it's kind of mind-boggling to me um, to want that role. When Bittner calls this, quote, the core of the police role, he means that, quote, there can be no doubt that this fe feature of police work is uppermost in the minds of people who solicit police aid or direct their attention to problems, and that persons against whom the police proceed have this feature in mind and conduct themselves accordingly, and that every conceivable police intervention projects uh, projects pardon, the message that force may be and may have to be used to achieve a desired objective. End quote. Yeah, fucking just using fear. <laughs> point blank. The role of police as potentially coercive problem solvers, as described, thus requires neither aggressive hostility in the police officer's demeanor, nor physical aggression as a frequent police tactic. Bittner cautions that, quote, the centrality of the capacity to use force in the police role does not entail the conclusion that the ordinary occupational routines consist of actual use of physical coercion. Many policemen are virtually never in the position of having to resort to it, end quote. So the potential of some resort to force is an aspect of the majority of cases where there is a dispute between citizens or between citizens and police. If the police officer is within his or her authority, the citizen is obliged to obey a police command. And some degree of physical force can be exercised by police when their lawful orders are resisted. Ooh, I don't know why. That just like really gave me the heebie-jeebies. Um, you ever get pulled over? And just that, that gut-wrenching feeling? Now for me, I'm white. And I'm young. I'm relatively attractive. So people will say, I can get out of things. I can use all that privilege to my advantage. Um, which is fucked up, but is the truth. There are a great variety, but it still scares the living shit out of me. I just wanted to say that. But it scares other people a hell of a lot more. There are a great variety of ways that individual police officers can respond to refusals to obey their orders. If a citizen's disobedience is unlawful, the officer can make an arrest for a criminal charge. If one or two officers are resisted they can request the coercive assistance of reinforcements and some degree of force is allowed when the targets of arrest resist or flee the typical urban police officer in the united states also carries on his or her person weapons capable of inflicting fatal injuries and also just any random person can be carrying a gun here almost always a handgun pistol or revolver carried on the person often heavier firearms shotguns or rifles are carried in police vehicles these instruments of deadly force have long been standard equipment for american police but the circumstances in which they can be used have shifted in recent decades away from the broad range of police authority that supports police use of non-lethal force in a wide variety of circumstances toward justifications based only on the police officer responding to the threat of deadly force against the officer or another person. The major doctrinal change to narrow the circumstances where deadly force is justified. This is interesting. Okay, this is, I want to know this. I don't know anything about this. I'm fucking hype for the information. Let's go. The major doctrinal change 
to narrow the circumstances where deadly force is justified was the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Tennessee v. Gardner. That sounds familiar to me, but I don't. I need to know more. In 1985, the opinion by Justice Byron White rejected the Tennessee law that had allowed for a police officer to use deadly force to defeat a burglar's attempt to escape arrest. The privilege invoked by the officer in the Garner case to justify the killing of a flee of a fleeing suspect. As a matter of constitutional principle, the Garner case was a decisive rejection of generalized law enforcement authority to use force as also a justification for killings by police. The wide variety of settings where police can threaten and use physical restraint would not justify use, uh, would not justify also the use of deadly force. Gardner was a significant step back from endorsing deadly force as a generally available tool in police administration. As a practical limitation on police gunfire, however, the 1985 decision was somewhat more why can't I read this fucking word? You know when you see a word and you're like, what is that? But you know what it is? Attenuated. I don't use, I'm, I'm not d- using legalese in my everyday life. Attenuated for two reasons. First, the use of deadly force against fleeing felons was far from universal practice and police administration by 1985. The Supreme Court was endorsing in Gardner a restraint that progressive police administrations had long approved. Second, the most common provocation of police shootings by 1985 was the response of police to threatened attacks against police. While the justifications, I can tell that this guy is in law um, because it just reads like stereo a little bit, uh, which is, is fine. It's, we're getting the information, but yeah. While the justifications for deadly force must now be narrow and specific, but do they, were they, was Tyree Nichols? Nope, not at all. There remains the very large number of instances where police use less than deadly force against citizens with the variety of coercive but non-lethal devices used by police expanding over time. Hoses, tasers, handcuffs, facilitators of restraint on movement and restrictions on communication have all been used in street settings as well as settings for confinement in police cars or holding facilities. Uh, Please terrify me. The full range of police use of force requires much more attention than it has received. Damn fucking right. Though I will not in this book attempt to cover the full range of issues generated by the many types of police force and the circumstances of their use in the United States, because that would be like how many books? Um, way too many. The central focus in this book is police use of deadly force in the street, uh, police settings where most killings by police happen. I offer three justifications for this emphasis. Give them to me. I don't know why you would need to uh, give justifications for this emphasis. I think it's pretty clear that it's um, egregious and appalling and terrifying and we should discuss it. But okay, I'm here for your explanation. First, the magnitude of the harm inflicted by police killings makes it the single greatest problem in current circumstances in police community relations in the United States. I will take that. That is, that's valid. Second, the information available on killings by police, while terribly in- incomplete and inaccurate, is vastly superior to the currently known facts about non-fatal injuries and um, depra- deprivations of liberty. That's a good word. You know what? I am going to start using that. Deprivations. I mean, that just, there's something about that word. It does it for me. Of liberty by police. Third, the constitutional consensus that has attempted to restrict the use of deadly force provides a clear mandate for regarding a high volume of fatalities inflicted by police as a specific problem worth special preventative effort. Yeah, I yeah, it's it's that's what I mean. Like, uh, we don't need the government to tell us that, like, killing people is bad. 
You know what I mean? Like, I, that's why I was like, why did we even need a justification? It's like, it's obvious that it's bad and we should fucking uh, understand it more and do something about it. But I guess everything gets done in this country through the government. Because we really haven't taken the reins as people, as a, you know, as a democracy. Like, what are we going to do? We're going to riot more or p- peacefully protest? Because it's not, it's, I mean, the riots really have not been enough. I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it. I said it a few times already. I, f- I fully believe that nothing's going to change here unless we seriously get serious about burning the shit to to the ground because reform in the police in policing is not doing it folks in the full generation after the supreme court of the united states decided tennessee versus gardner a sharp contrast has developed between on one hand the range of circumstances where police are permitted to use some degree of force to impose solutions on citizens to enforce the law and to effect arrest and maintain physical custody over persons they arrest and on the other hand the much narrower class of cases where the police officer is permitted to use deadly force where only the threat of serious injury to the officer or to other others justifies deadly responses by law enforcement that sharp contrast is clear in legal doctrine but has not been the subject of sustained empirical research therein lies the rub is there a clear distinction between the conflicts and circumstances that produce patterns of less than lethal force and those which provoke gunfire from uninformed officers where departments have success in maintaining that distinction are the number of killings reduced from that experienced in other departments although the volume of killings by police in the u.s is quite high as compared to that of other developed nations, use of deadly force is also far from a common event in the usual pattern of urban policing. Interesting. I don't know if I agree with that, but let's continue. While I will argue that killings by p- police probably total around a thousand in the United States each year, we know from the reported data that for every officer, <clears throat> who kills each year in the United States, many hundreds of police and sheriffs on patrol do not kill. Okay. Yeah. Fine. I no, I don't like where he's going with this Um, in that, in that his train of thought right now. Let's finish this fucking sentence. And each of the nation's more than half a million law enforcement officers will have hundreds, if not thousands of interactions with citizens. Yes, because there are way too fucking many police. So even the very high rate of fatalities from police use of force in the United States is a needle in the haystack phenomenon among the hundreds of millions of contacts between police and citizens. No. Um, I, I definitely don't like where this is going. In the remainder of part one of this book, I address basic factual issues to better understand the relationship between the wide spectrum spectrum of street policing and the many hundreds of citizen deaths by deadly force at the hands of police each year in the United States. I begin analysis of known and needed facts in chapter two with an attempt to determine the rate of killings by police in the U.S. and whether it has varied substantially in recent years. In chapter three, I consider what is known about the circumstances that led to police use of deadly force because they're fucking angry um, and they can. That's why they do it. How many of the killings by police are necessary to protect police or others? Is the risk of a fatality resulting from police use of force simply a function of the volume of total contacts that officers have with citizens? Or is it concentrated in particular circumstances, settings, or locales? I also address the circumstances and explanations that are associated with killings by police. What types of police-citizen interactions generate use of deadly force? What is the variance in death rates among various different cities? And what circumstances are associated with relatively high and low rates? This is a lot of questions, lots of things he's answering, which is interesting. And we're going to need to read another book uh, just specifically on race and policing in this country because this book is not going to do it people it's not going to do it but we're going to get some great information we just might get some opinions like the one that we heard 
You know what I mean? It's not a needle in a haystack. No. Because of the limited data available in reporting systems and research, which is scary, that's scary, I must present a mixture of partial explanations and important questions without answers. And I like that he is doing that and saying, I can't give you the concrete answers because we don't have all the information, because uh, we don't report on things in this country, because we haven't been fucking required to. But even the incomplete data now available provides useful insight and a clear portrait of information that must be uncovered for basic understanding of why high rates of killings by police persist in the United States and how we can reduce the number of unnecessary deaths. I'm a little concerned that he's not going to be talking about men whatsoever. At all. I'm, I'm not concerned. I know it's a fact. I know he's not going to bring up um, that it's going to be I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be hundred percent, hundred percent are all going to be at the hands of men, which is something we never fucking put together. In chapter four, I compare the rate and pattern of police killings in the United States with information on killings by the police in several other first world nations. That's going to be interesting. That's in chapter four. I'm excited about that. Asking whether the rate of death in the U S is typical or extreme. It's fucking extreme. When compared to those of the United Kingdom, Germany, Canada, and Australia. I also address what comparisons of the rates and circumstances of killings in the United States tell us about what conditions in this country led to our distinctive patterns and rates. I'm interested in knowing what those conditions, like what he's going to bring up are those conditions. Is it going to be white supremacy? Crossing my fingers. Is it going to be misogyny? Crossing my fingers. In chapter five, I consider the circumstances that put police at risk of violent death and what is known about deadly force policies as an influence on the vulnerability of police to fatal attacks. Okay, fine. In chapter six, I compare long-term trends in killings of police with patterns over the same period of killings by police. Because the situations and weapons involved in the deaths of police officers are the very threats that the Supreme Court had singled out in Tennessee v. Gardner as offering central justification for police use of lethal force, that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense why he has to talk about it. I guess you got to come at it from both angles. Thus, I examine the trends in killings of and by the police in the United States to see how clearly changes in the risks faced by police are reflected in variations over time in the number of civilian deaths from police use of force. Finally, in chapter seven, I examine the economic consequences for governments and individuals of killings by police asking to what extent governments either know the costs of such killings or unknowingly absorb the costs caused by the deaths and also how the costs might be measured okay not really very much interested in that chapter but are we gonna read it we're gonna take it in yeah maybe there'll be something interesting in there but i'm not super jazzed about that one my attempts to profile the character and causes of police violence in chapters two through seven will thus serve as a foundation for my analysis in part two of this book of the prospects for reducing the costs of police violence without compromising public or police safety huh Part two of this book, the prospects for reducing the costs. Does he mean that? Because he wrote this book. He chose that word. Does he mean monetary costs? Or does he mean just the cost of life of police violence? Or does he mean both? Perhaps he chose it because it could be inferred as both. But I feel like it's not the right word that was used there. And yes, I am being, I'm being judgmental of that. I don't like that. I don't like that he said that um, because someone, someone's life and money like words words fucking have meaning and he chose it for a, a reason i don't know this guy might just be all about the money um and i mean he is a lawyer so he is in law he teaches that let's let's double check professor of law professor of law at the uc berkeley school of law yeah so you know he's in the government there's no money in there's no money in removing money that is terrifying okay we're at chapter two i need i need a break i need a sip of my water getting get hot in here i got the lights on i'm schwitzing k 
Killings by police. The numbers game. The problems encountered by those seeking to determine the volume of police killings in the U.S. are an important issue for two reasons. I like how he sets it up. It's like reasons. Like, the, here are my three reasons. Here are my two reasons. People are intimidated by the media. Facts. 100% facts. You are not wrong. You are not, not wrong at all. It's all about the money. It's all connected. First, the numbers killed by an important indication of large a problem, uh, how large a problem police use of lethal force is in the United States. Yes. Yes. Without a reliable measure of the national problem, it is impossible to estimate how important the problem is when compared to other aspects of American crime and violence. Second, without a reliable count of killings in the United States, there is no way to estimate the relative magnitude of police killings in America compared to the rates found in other countries. Eh, there's no way to estimate the relative magnitude. I mean, yeah, but like you got to use what you got. So this is why he wrote the book. Yet as suggested in chapter one, the estimates of killings by the police have always been clearly inadequate for the national lever level with no sustained effort, effort to generate a reliable estimate. That's fucked up. Prior to 2014, the obvious lack of reliable national estimate had not been regarded as an important problem in government. I mean, that was prior to 2014. Like, that is not that fucking long ago. I curse a lot. Sorry. Not sorry. As with so much of the current discussion of police use of lethal force, there is a clear divide between the low visibility of the issue prior to 2014. It's like we're starting from scratch. And the more sustained effort to comprehend... The problems after the cluster of notorious police killings in late 2014 and 2015. This chapter's survey of data sources and problems suggests a of data sources and problems suggests a rather dramatic bottom line. The annual death toll from police activity in the U.S. is well over 1,000 civilians each year, three killings a day. My survey begins with a consideration of the three governmental efforts designed to measure killings by police in the course of police activities. One, the National Center for Health Statistics of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which documents the volume of all deaths in the U.S., listing as a separate category of deaths thus caused by what we call, quote, legal interventions, end quote, a code used throughout the intentional system of death reporting under the aus a species i don't like that word <laughs> i don't know why just makes me want to say auspicious uh, a species of the world health organization to the quote justifiable homicides end quote reported by police and compiled by the supplemental homicide reporting shr system administered by the uniform criminal reporting section of the fbi this I feel like I'm I feel like I'm getting ready to I'm going to be writing a law and order thing after this. You know, I'm I could I could write an episode of law and order. And not about the special victims unit because um that women's suffering should not be nightly entertainment. This segment of the SHR program documents only a small segment of the monthly homicide reports. Only a small segment. Small. Just several hundred entries a year in the national homicide total of more than 10,000. Wow. While the legal intervention, that's in quote, deaths tracked by the National Center for Health Statistics, by comparison, documents a much smaller fragment of the millions of deaths reported to and by the National Vital Statistics System of the U.S. And three, the arrest-related deaths, ARD program directed by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, BJS, which since 2003 has included homicides by police in the data it collects. As I will show, all of these official statistical reports presents incomplete and awful, often biased descriptions of police killings in the United States. Because like, duh, because like obvious. Oh my gosh, it's just, there's so much fucking corruption. Ugh. The second part of this chapter God, just just get to it. He's like, the first part, the second part, the third part. I was like, get to the parts. <laughs> the second part of this chapter profiles several efforts to use the analysis of media reports of individual killings to estimate a minimum volume of citizens killed by police. That's interesting. 
a cluster of mass media outlets, 538.com. Um, I've never heard of that, by the way. Am I dumb? No, I'm not. I'm just not in the know with that. And I will be. Just give me a fucking second. The Washington Post and The Guardian used available reports of individual cases to build a minimum estimate of true death cases. All of these estimates produced rates much higher than were found at the SHR and BJS sets of official statistics, despite the fact that a basis in media reported cases may itself undercount the true total. Okay, this is starting to get fucking spooky. Should any police killings go unreported? That um, was like a statement and not a question, but it felt like it should be a rhetorical question, but it was not posed as that. It was a period and not a question. I described the methods and limits of these crowdsourcing estimates and the impact of their findings on what we know about the reliability of official reports regarding the likely magnitude of police killings in the United States. You can't even fucking trust the statistics. Okay. I am, I am, I'm, I am happy he is like deep diving into this and doing a thorough analysis. Like I am proud to be reading this book even though there was some some questionable sentences I wasn't super jazzed about but again everything is nuanced um the last part of the chapter provides my analysis of a best guess about the true number of police killings and also considers the limits of official statistics as information not only about the number of such killings but also about the circumstances of the killings the victims of such killings and the proportion of killings by police that meet legal standards of justification. Okay. This analysis also provides a foundation for understanding the use and the limits of governmental statistics when the cases reported by the FBI, vital statistics, and the BJS attempt to describe who was killed and the circumstances of the death. Read them for fucking filth, Franklin. The official stories. The U.S., government provides a comprehensive account of what are called the vital statistics that would be a fucking dope metal band like death metal the vital statistics of all who reside in the nation in its official count of births and deaths as a part of an international system of reporting classifying vital statistics to learn about trends over time and country to country variations in health stats vital statistics fuck yeah do the residents of Norway have more or fewer children than those of the United States? Well, I don't fucking know. Do I really care? I mean, it might be good information to know. I wanna, I, I'm happy that this generation is not having as many kids because the state of the world is just not it. Are any differences in birth rates observed the result of one of the nations having a younger population? When each nation keeps comprehensive information on not only the number of births, but also the age of women giving births, these are questions that can be answered. Okay, they can be answered. As with births, I don't know why I got so sassy there, but I just wanted to. Let me be who I truly am. As with births, the National Vital Statistics System compiles comprehensive data on the number of deaths, causes of deaths, and the demographic characteristics of those who die. The source of data on deaths and births is county-level health departments. The system is also completely accurate. Okay, what? Something is completely accurate? I don't believe that. In determining the number of Americans who die each year, and good, if not perfect, shut, shut your mouth, perfect? At determining the immediate causes of death. So, Vital statistics will contain trustworthy counts on the number of citizens killed by various forms of weapons, including deaths caused by firearms. Okay, that is good information. Good for us, because we need to know. But how can it also tell us how many of the persons killed by gunfire were shot by police? This is where the, quote, legal interventions reporting noted above comes into play. For many years, the number of killings by police was substantially underreported simply because county coroners didn't identify many killings that were caused by police. Okay, interesting. And thus, while the report of a death went into the system, it was not listed in the legal intervention category. 
the likely cause of the problem is innocent oversight. Just so innocent. Just don't know how you died. It's just... I'm just doing my job. I'm just the corner here. Just pick it up and clean it up. I don't, I don't know. I don't ask questions. It's just so innocent. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because, as I've observed, police killings are a tiny category in total deaths. Less than one-tenth of one percent. And these cases have never been regarded as an extremely important aspect of vital statistics reports. But the failure to notice and address the undercount is also another robust indicator that police killings were not seen as an important national statistic in the U.S. for a long time. Whatever the reason for the undercount of legal intervention killings, there was no basis for vital statistics to estimate the magnitude of uncounted killings, and thus no basis for using the known volume of citizen deaths from legal interventions as a foundation for a guess about the true volume of such deaths. Studies by Colin Lofton and his associates demonstrated that the total totals for legal intervention killings were consistently lower in the years 1976 to 1998 than the volume of killings reported by the FBI in its supplemental homicide reports, the SHR. And that was in uh, something he wrote in 2003. But while the number of killings documented in the SHR reports were somewhat higher than the number of legal intervention killings reported by the vital statistics for the same period, the SHR total was likewise an undercount. We're not surprised. As I will demonstrate in the next subsection, that is legalese for you right there. The next subsection, subsection CBD, 23 and me um (laughs) the listen my dad was a lawyer his dad was a lawyer and so forth and I dated a lawyer for a while I can I can poke fun the next subsection and neither of these two measures provided a plausible projection of the true volume of killings by police the rates indicated by these indexes provide a minimum estimate of the true volume of police killings but no clear indication of just how much the true volume is being underreported, and I guess we'll never know, and that kind of sucks. Figure 2-1 on this opposite page here shows the trends from the time series and illustrates, again, the maxim that two wrongs don't make a right. All right. Okay, so that is just the example he was just showing right there. Everything that he just described, he just put it into the annual numbers of justifiable homicides committed by police officers. And then he's using the SHR and the National Vital Statistics, which are the two lines I will show you. The first is the SHR, which is slightly higher, which is like, it looks to be um, around 400, a little bit lower, a little bit higher here and there. And then the National Vital is around like 300. And all right up. There's your graph. God, I love graphs. Something about a good graph really gets the people going. It gets the party started. Indeed, the Lofton Group study demonstrates substantial gaps in the ages and demographic details of the victims reported in the two data sets. A clear demonstration that the true volume of killings could be substantially greater than either of the official reports indicated because so many cases were apparently reported in one system or the other, but not both. <sighs> God damn it, we just, like, just don't even care. We just never saw it as an issue here in, in the U.S. More recent information from the FBI and vital statistics. I need like a, a good way of saying that, like a really rock star way of saying that. And I just feel like it's going to hurt my voice and I'm not going to commit. Shame me. Shows a shift from the FBI total having the num- uh, having the higher numbers. Figure 2.2 compares the fatalities reported by the two systems for the five years beginning in 2008. Okay, so 2008 to 2012. Um The two systems report very similar numbers in 2008 through 2011, but then the vital statistic death count opens a substantial lead, reporting 23% more killings than the SHR in 2011 and 29% more deaths in 2012. 
and this is that graph right there. It's a little bump up in the reporting here where it shouldn't be. They should be equal. Um, the current lead of the vital statistics count may be a result of the VS, the vital stats, administrate administrators creation of a new entity called the National Violent Death Reporting System, otherwise known as NVDRS. This is not an everyday discourse. The wide swing in reporting is yet more evidence of substantial undercounting in the estimation of killings by the police in the U.S., expansion of the NVDRS to all 50 states would greatly improve the accurate reporting of homicide by police. What are, the, what are you saying? It's the expanding to all 50 states? Is it not in all 50 states? I'm confused by that statement, and I wish you would elaborate. Hopefully you will. He does not elaborate. God damn it. Here we go. What time is it? It's 1037. Here. Eastern Standard Time. I need to go to the store and get eggs that I can't afford and milk that I could be making here with raw cashews, but I'm not going to because I just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. But I will. I will. One day. Hopefully this week. Cross your fingers. And I also need to pick up some like egg noodles or something. Something good for me, you know? Just more egg, more protein. Because I got some vegan crumbles in the fridge. I got to eat tonight. So I think I'm going to go until, let's see. I'm just checking out, looking a little bit further. I don't want to get too deep into this chapter and not be able to finish it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's quite a bit more information here. All right. I'm going to read the supplemental homicide reports to the FBI, which is two more pages. And then I'm going to log off for tonight. I will be back tomorrow. Okay, you can count on it. Around 9 p.m., um, my current lifestyle is scary because I still need to find a, f a job. So I can't guarantee the time. But once I have that schedule, I will let you know. And I really hope it's soon. But around 9 p.m. is is the vibe. So supplemental homicide reports to the FBI. It's a lot of information. I hope you're keeping up. It's t It's a lot. Get your pen and paper out. So you can call back to this stuff. We can talk about it with your friends. The second national reporting system that classifies killings by the police as, quote, justifiable homicides by police, end quote, is part of the larger registry of supplemental homicide reports created by local police departments and sheriffs at the request of the Uniform Crime Reporting Program, the UCRP of the F. I. Starting in 1976, this supplemental program for homicides differs from other data on crime sent into the FBI by police departments because data on other crimes are reported only as statistical summaries. Example, 48 armed robberies in the last quarter of 2015. That the FBI then accumulates into a national statistic aggregate. By contrast, each violent killing that occurs in a reporting agency becomes an individual event narrow, narrated in a brief summary with the month's other killings in the supplemental reporting system. Just as killings by the police are only a small part of a larger death statistics system in the VS, Vital Statistics Program, several hundred killings in a total population of millions of deaths, the justifiable homicides by police are only one type of the violent killings reported in the SHR program. Several hundred cases a year in a population of several thousand violent deaths. But while, quote, legal intervention, end quote, deaths are a tiny fraction of total deaths in the vital statistics tally, the 400 or so police killings each year included in the supplemental reports as justifiable homicides by police are a much larger fraction of the total homicides in the reports. There's the information I wanted. And the weapons and victim uh, demography. Why did that? Why does that word look weird to me? Of the police killings that are included have more in common with the other deaths included in the FBI series than do the 
quote, legal intervention deaths in the vital statistics when one compares them to the patterns, causes, and populations of greater risk for nonviolent deaths. So, so, in providing information, the FBI's program has some advantages over the vital statistics count in that hundreds of police killings are less likely to go unnoticed. But there are also profound limits in the way in which killings by the police are documented and reported. Yeah, by their own people. Of course, they're going to be inaccurate. One major problem is that participation in the reporting program is voluntary. And some police agencies do not participate. We're just going to opt out of that one, kids. Folks, no need to do the paperwork. We're going home early tonight. Let's go, boys. With a loophole that large, it is rather surprising that in the 1980s and the 1990s, the FBI program consistently reported a greater number of killings by police as justifiable homicides than did the vital statistics program in its tally of legal interventions. We know that many law enforcement agencies do not send in reports, but there is no useful way to estimate what proportion of total killings by police occur in cities and within county law enforcement agencies who do not participate in the program. It should not be fucking voluntary. The second major problem with the FBI supplemental homicide reports is that there is no auditing of the accuracy of the descriptions of events in these killings by the reporting police departments. While some auditing of the the statistics on what are called, quote, index crimes, end quote, sent to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting Program, all capitalized, does occur, there is no quality control auditing of the supplemental homicide descriptions that local police departments provide. This is a particular problem because reporting police departments have direct interests in how such cases get classified. Of course they do. Of course they do. And even a pecuniary interest. Oh, look at me. I'm a lawyer. Pecuniary interest in the legality of each particular killing. Because whether the department or the municipal government might have to compensate the relatives of victims depends on whether the person should be found to have been wrongfully killed. Okay, so maybe it is about money. Mm. So, and covering their own asses. So in completing reports, police have incentives to find every killing by an officer justified. In a nutshell, the voluntary nature of the reporting system means that significant numbers of killings by police do not get included in the official numbers mentioned. And the absence of auditing means that agencies with clear pecuniary interests in justifying cases are the only source of information available to the reporting system. And I'm going to stop there. We're going to put a pin in that. That was a lot of information. Let's take that in. Lots of different agencies. And basically, we're getting to the nitty gritty of the flaws in the hierarchy of reporting and power and how there's just been absolutely no oversight, clearly. And it was not even a concern, not public concern until 2014, 2015. Um, It's pretty wild. Um, Scary. Let's keep learning. I'm going to go to the store and pick up those goods until I can grow my own food and I can have my own chickens. But first, I got to get that job. (laughs) LOLOL. Life is a joke sometimes. Not mine. Just kidding. It sometimes is a joke. I'm a comedian. My life is comical. Thank you so much for sticking with me. Um... My eyesight is so bad and the screen's kind of far that I have to be like, mm. thank you, Josh Dies today for listening with me. I will be here tomorrow around 10. We will continue deep diving into understanding the police system, its systems, all of its reporting, all the, the data, all the statistics seems with, you know, I have emotion there, but at least the information being presented is, you know, kind of void of emotion in this so it's able it's easier for me to kind of take in the information without getting too um angry but i am angry 
And yeah, let's stay in the know. I will see you tomorrow. I still don't have a sign off. I need to work on that. My brain hurts. But I'm not surprised. Not surprised by so much of this information. It's just really fucking sad. Oh, disheartening and scary. But yeah, let's fucking learn more together. Tomorrow, let's get through this book. Because we have so many more to read. We have so much more information to take in. Let's understand. Together. All right. I see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Oh, I'm getting old.